Welcome to Market Overtime on the Schwab Network. I'm Oliver Rennick. Today we're going to take a deep dive into trading strategy and techniques with Gareth Soloway, Chief Strategist at VerifiedInvesting.com, a regular on our shows live on the Schwab Network. We've got some more time today. Gareth, thanks for sitting down with us. Oh, such a pleasure to be here. Looking forward to discussing all this stuff. Appreciate that. So give me a first kind of walk through on your process because we're often in the weeds in the middle of the week talking about what's moving, where charts are breaking. Give me an idea kind of how you go through your strategy and your process as a trader. Yeah, so, so one of the things that really dawned on me in my early years of trading is that when you're trading, you're not trading a company, you're trading human emotion and human psychology. And so in that, what I start to do is I look at the technicals and I'm a pure technical trader that looks at pivot points on charts, trend lines, channels, um, Fibonacci retraces, all of these things. And what I found is that in general, my sweet spot for trading is either at reversal points when a stock is topping out or bottoming out, getting in being one of the first in on that position for the reversal or after it's just made a small reversal when it starts to form a bull flag. So in that way, you get kind of the beginning of the reversal, but you start looking for that bullish consolidation off of a low or bearish consolidation off of a high. And so really what I want to do is I never want to be someone who chases. I've always been a leader in life. I've been someone who's first in. I want to do that in trading as well, because what happens is when you wait too long, you sometimes get caught holding the bag. And I'm sure we've all experienced those type of things in our trading and investing career. And so I want to be early in and I look at those key technical points on the charts and really what you're looking for is the alignment of multiple factors. So let's say you have a Fibonacci 3, uh, 618 retrace also at a gap fill on Apple. That is going to give you a high probability scenario for a bounce if it's a coming down into that level or a short if it's coming into that level. And so, so that's just a rundown of what I look for. But again, I try to shut off what's up here and what's in here, right? My heart doesn't mean anything. What I feel, my gut, it doesn't mean anything in trading. It's all about the charts and the charts are really the truth tellers. That's a, uh, I think a good way to think about it is uh, being agnostic, right? To kind of the underlying, I feel like that is a pinnacle of uh, what traders try to achieve. In my experience, I started out as a, uh, journalist covering macro and my background in writing in markets was very sort of economic top down but when I came to TD Ameritrade and then Schwab I learned how traders think and I really started kind of believing in the technicals and I find it interesting the way you frame the technical kind of beginnings of your path to trading walk me through kind of uh, the way you view technicals and fitting in with the macro because it does seem like a really important part of it that when you're not a trader you kind of look at the lines on the charts and you go okay is this stuff really work and what I found is that often it does work and especially in more speculative types of markets the technical stuff works well like I don't think it worked very well like back in the day like 2017 VIX like you know 10 11 are there different environments where the strategy works better yeah, hundred percent. You're dead on when it comes to the VIX being too low. So, so really, the sweet spot for trading and investing based on technicals is somewhere in the realm of let's say sixteen to eighteen on the VIX, all the way up to about thirty. And what that means is that you're having a normalized environment for psychology for human behavior. Once you get really low on the VIX, like even where we are now, which is like twelve, thirteen, the markets just float up, and the technicals don't work as well. And the same thing on the opposite side when you have all out panic in there in the markets your levels on a technical basis will be ridden right through it'll blow right through those levels because everyone is in full out panic and so the zone is really in that mid portion of the vix when it's in that area that's when the technicals work the best and then turning to the macro the macro can be really helpful but the macro and this is something i've gotten myself in trouble with in the past is the macro analysis gives you the bigger view of what's going to happen so it's going to tell you hey we're on a path for the next six to 12 months, maybe two years, where this is going to play out. Like for instance, I'm a believer that eventually we do have a recession later this year. But when I'm looking at a chart, 
I can't let that impact my decision making about a trade that I'm going to take today that I may only hold for let's say a month or two. And so so you have to be able to differentiate between the macro view, which is the longer term view versus the very short term swing trading, which is what I do. Okay, uh, that's helpful. And I like the framing of two the sweet spots of volatility that uh, create kind of fertile ground for trading. I think again, to kind of draw on my own understanding of markets is that when I was learning about markets uh, in 2010 to 2017, it was just kind of up and up uh, and a steady grind mm -hmm. where when things started to get more volatile, basically kind of 2018 VIX explosion, things started to get interesting into COVID. And then you really started to see how some of these lines on charts work and how the technicals uh, do inform. I think for me too, watching crypto as a highly speculative asset class and the way it was like biblically adhering to textbook technical stuff was an eye opener too. Do you view the charts as being more more helpful when an asset class or when a market is more speculative in general? Yeah, so I, I think that's one of the interesting things about crypto is that you have many crypto investors who are kind of like, oh, this is crypto. This is a new asset class. It's going to behave in its own way. It's not going to follow any of this old stuff that those old fogies do when they trade stocks <laughs> or they trade commodities. Um, and in reality, it really does still follow it because what you're doing is the crypto traders, let's say there's millions of them and there are millions of them, they still behave in a certain way. So for the technicals to work, not only do you need the VIX in that right zone of volatility, but you also want people, you want a large group of people, the law, law of large numbers. And when you have a large group, generally it doesn't matter. Greed and fear never change in the markets and in any asset class. And that's what allows the technicals to play out. So the one situation where you want to stay away from doing technical analysis is on something that's very thin. Like let's say a stock trades 50,000 shares a day. One trader could dump 10,000 shares of that stock mm -hmm. and influence that chart and really negate any sort of technical. So it's about volume and liquidity along with the right kind of volatility range. Yeah, it's a great point. Uh, when you are kind of starting your session for the day, uh, do you have a main kind of watch list of uh, assets that you're going through? How often does that change? Do you kind of, like we talk the big tech names a lot. I know you like to trade those. When you've got a client base of traders that you're working with, people I think tend to focus on those bigger names, but how does a trade kind of make its way into your purview? Like when do you kind of move down the market cap spectrum or find stuff that might be otherwise sort of overlooked? How does that show up on your radar? Yeah, so so the couple things I do, I start scanning and I, and I literally I have my laptop in bed before I go to bed and I'm kind of looking through basic charts. Uh, generally, I focus on the S&P 500 or the NASDAQ 100, the names that are generally big enough where I can get in, I can get out and the spread is not too crazy when I'm trading it. But basically, I'm looking for stocks that are starting to get extended or starting to get oversold. And then I'm looking for the key char characteristics, the gap fills, the double bottoms, the reversal signals within the charts. And as soon as I see something getting close to one of these levels, I kind of put it on my watch list for the next day or the, the following days. And so there is really a process that a trader goes through, a swing trader or a day trader, where you start making a list of what's in play. And then to be honest, the next morning I wake up, flip on the news, I look at what's moving in the markets and what you're looking for is volatility in certain names. Like, so for instance, Chewy Today or Dick Sporting Goods or uh, Abercrombie & Fitch, those will be the ones I zone in on because people are acting oftentimes irrationally and, and emotionally because of the moves. And there might be an opportunity in those versus if you look at a stock that's just going sideways, right? The computer bots are trading it. There's really no reason to get involved in that. You'll get chopped up by the computers at that point and lose money versus the emotional traders. You want the smaller investors to be involved. That's where the opportunities are. Mm. You want a, a deep uh, a, a liquidity. You want a, a big field of players, right? Um, so Gareth, That's right. as you mentioned, you don't try to get bogged down in the macro. Uh, but when it comes to trading, like when you go to the index level, kind of effectively macro, how much do you dabble in like bonds, currencies, or do you mostly keep it into equities? 
No, I definitely chart chart everything. And so, so for instance, one of my favorite positions is is right now looking and, and eyeing the TLT. The TLT again goes up when rates go down. And so I'm looking at charts. We had a channel on the the ten year, the ten year yield that broke to the downside. We've now retraced back up to resistance. And so based on that, I can chart that out and expect a pullback on yield. And that's the beauty of the charts. Is you know people often will tell you, and this is something I tell people as well, is that the charts almost dictate the news and people say well how does the chart know well the chart doesn't know the specific news but it's ultimately telling you what people are underlying expecting and that often comes true and so again it can be something like oil starting to roll over and then all of a sudden the economy in the u.s gets weak because you have better investors than even me institutions that understand the process of what to expect in the oil markets and understand the economics of what's going on and so so super super interesting stuff overall to get in depth in this technical side of trading to your point on rates, uh, when I think about uh, trading, I try and find uh, scenarios in which two out of three of the visible outcomes skew one way, where if I can get the odds mm -hmm. on my side, like for a macro regime, bonds right now, I can think of recession as a scenario, I can think of the uh, stagflation as a scenario, I can think of growth as a scenario, and it seems like basically two out of three of those equate to yields higher. Is that kind of a way to uh, approach a, a macro trade and general uh, trading, trying to find uh, scenarios in which most outcomes bend one way? Yeah, absolutely. I, that's what you want to do is it's essentially what I call factors, right? So, so you know, everyone can find one factor for a trade being in the direction that they think it might go. But can you stack two or three or four factors in alignment? And that's where the probabilities like you're mm -hmm. talking about start to go in your direction. And that's really what it's all about. I mean, if you're a trader and investor, you want to get the probabilities in your favor. You essentially want to be the casino, not the gambler that's walking in there, where overall you're going to eventually lose money as the gambler while the casino overall makes money so you got to position yourself there and it's important to be very kind of like you said in the beginning agnostic right you can't go in with lots of preconceived notions you have to go in and say what is the data telling me like what is the trend here of the data for instance right jobless claims popped up to like 231,000 recently and then came right back down so we had one data point but you didn't have confirming data points there yes we've seen GDP a little bit weaker we've seen some of these other non-farm payrolls numbers coming in a little lower than expected but it's not enough yet to really confirm a change. However, you look in deeper in the analysis, like let's say the U6 and unemployment numbers. Those are people that are underemployed. That's starting to pop up. We talked about, um, or we've talked about the consumer. The consumer today looking very healthy, ANF, Dick Sporting Goods, um, Chewy. Uh, but at the same time, you do have Disney and Starbucks and other consumer companies that are starting to show some weakness. And we even saw American Airlines recently warn that, that travel is starting to suffer. So it's about looking at these different things and trying to make sense out of the data in a very agnostic way, and then eventually coming to that conclusion with multiple factors. I like uh, the point about the consumer, which has uh, been a very unique area where there's still spending happening, but it seems it's dropped down as we've seen a lot of the car companies have to cut prices, right? We're, we're willing to spend, we want to spend, but uh, we're just doing it on lower ticket items. And, and I think, and, and, and sorry to jump in, Oliver, but I think one of the things that people have to understand is that you have 62% of the U.S. that is invested in stocks. As long as the stock market keeps making new all-time highs, that 62% will feel like they can spend because they see their 401ks, their IRAs going up, up, and away. But if you look at the underbelly of McDonald's and some of these other lower kind of tier income consumer plays, that's really where you're starting to see it. And, and my fear is overall for the economy is that eventually, it spreads to that upper tier once the stock market inevitably pulls back. I mean, listen, we could still go up another 5 or 10%, but at some point we all know there will be a corrective move. And my guess is it'll coincide with the Fed pushing it in that direction to bring inflation under control. It looks like from a long-term chart that I'm looking at from you on the S&P, you think we might be getting close to a turning point after we failed to rally on NVIDIA's earnings. Now we've got some kind of ugly-looking candles on the chart. To connect it with our discussion on the economy here, Gareth, if stocks do pull back in the near term, do you view that as being a result of higher rates pressuring like we got in 22, or do you view this as a scenario where stocks drop off 
off, but maybe bonds actually work as a hedge because the economy is slowing down. Take me through a scenario in which equities do get that hit, how it happens, and what role bonds play. Yeah, so that's it's a great, great point. So so the way I see it playing out is that ultimately what we will see is the economy beginning to slow faster and faster and faster. And this latest round of earnings over the last three months or so has started to show us that there are brands that are starting to suffer. Some are still OK, kind of the higher end ticket items, maybe a little bit more on the OK side. But eventually you see this economy weaken. Now, normally the investing public is going to cheer that. And we've seen the markets go up on poor economic data because people think the Fed can then print a lot of money and lower interest rates. But my thesis is that ultimately inflation stays north of 3%. Maybe it comes down to 3%, maybe 2.9. But the scary thing for stocks is if we get into a recession or close to a recession, and if if inflation is still 3% or greater, eventually the market and the stock market begins to worry that we're not going to be able to see the action that has saved this market since 2009, since the, the blasters came out from the Federal Reserve. And that's going to be the, the realization point that, oh my goodness, the Fed cannot do everything they used to do to save this market and push it back up. And that's really the scenario where I think yields do come in. They just don't go back to that 2% or 1% levels that we've seen in the past. And I think ultimately what we see is a slowdown in the economy and almost like that stagnation in the economy where it just can't get out of bed anymore. It's kind of stuck in this low level grade recession. How much do you think that's going to uh, uh, kind of wake up or shake up the trading community? Like when you look at traders in your groups and uh, your clients, do you view that they uh, is are they skewed their perception of trading from an era specifically during COVID? But to your point, just kind of generally post uh, crisis where things generally went up, but then during COVID too, kind of the casino broke a little bit. To use your analogy earlier, where like you could walk in and just uh, get paid basically is uh, yep. is the easy trading period over and how uh, would you advise folks to kind of navigate that going forward so I do think that, that one of the concerning things is how popular index funds have gotten and how everyone just thinks like, hey, this is the easiest trade in the world. Just put your money in these index funds and you'll do fine. And I do think that we have not seen the reckoning, right? I mean, yes, COVID was a big collapse, but we also recovered to new all-time highs within right. months. So it wasn't like people got accustomed to being like, oh, don't worry if the market or my portfolio drops 30%. Don't worry, within three months, I'll be back to break even and then I'll be in the green. And I think, again, if for any of us that have traded for longer than just you know less the last five or ten years we remember a period where listen i mean in, in the dot-com era it took what 20 years for the nasdaq to recover back to all-time highs before breaking higher and i think that's something that unfortunately every generation of investors has to go through at some point and we have a lot of investors like you said that got into crypto they got into i mean this was when they came out their coming out party if you will was when the markets were just you know fed printing of money just supporting the markets nonstop. and i do think there will be a point whether it's this year or in the next five years where we see a new paradigm or at least new to these investors where it starts to be a little trickier and it doesn't recover as quickly one of the things I think that we've already seen is that shift up in quality as kind of a preface maybe to that uh, a broader kind of wake up or break down in the everything goes up trade. The last uh, year and a half, as we have made highs, it's been a very concentrated market, particularly in higher quality trades. And thankfully, those higher quality uh, stocks generally have been tech. So is there anything that can break that high quality trade? I mean, even NVIDIA, which has run uh, you know, an insane amount, still on a price earning the growth is fairly reasonable. I mean, a lot of these big tech companies, some argue, are your sort of ballast of safety. Is there anything that could break those trades, Gareth? So, so that's and that's one of my biggest concerns is that I just read this morning that that hedge funds are more overloaded in these top six trillion dollar names than they've ever been before. And the problem is, is that, yes, based on NVIDIA's current growth with their margins where they are, the valuation on NVIDIA is reasonable at these levels. But 
The kicker is this. China just announced $47 billion for, a, for chip development of AI chips. We know that what they did with solar, right? If we remember there, they flooded the market with solar panels. They crushed the U.S. producers and they crushed margins. And I do worry that that's just one angle coming for the AI chips over the next few years. So sure, I mean, if NVIDIA can somehow figure out how to keep margins at 75% plus, they could easily continue up. But I'm in the camp where I think that like Tesla, Tesla in 2021. Remember, Tesla was the golden child, the only EV player that was worth investing in, and it paid, it did, did well. I mean, amazing upside. I remember Kathy Woods being in that trade, and it was just nuts to the upside. But look at Tesla now. Competition comes. They had to drop their vehicle prices, margins contracted. And so I do think that there's a risk here where eventually it permeates. When there's great margins to be had, it draws in other competitors, and eventually those margins go down. And so that's my big fear for investment videos that I see kind of a future much like Tesla, where eventually it does come down significantly. And the rest of these companies, as long as the consumer is there and these corporations are spending, they can do well. But what does happen if we get in a recession and these other corporations that are powering the Microsofts what if they start to really stumble? The valuation on Microsoft is a little insane at like 30 plus PE. Hmm. Last thing I'll say here, just to keep it simple, is there was a time, for those of you that are new as investors, there was a time when large cap tech and large cap mega cap plays, the, the proper PE was in the range of 10 to 12. And we're now at 30-ish on a lot of these names. And I do, I am concerned about that overall because there's so much focus on the investing in these names that if there is a hiccup, this market's in a lot of trouble. Yeah, I, I kind of err on the side that uh, the riskiest parts of the AI trade might be the companies that have actually bought up all the chips because now they've got, they spent all this money, right. the stocks have been rewarded, but we really haven't seen much of product yet. Like I'm sure Microsoft Copilot right. will be fascinating and useful, but we really haven't seen a lot of delivery of product yet. And some of them are certainly going to compete with each other, right? Like a Microsoft versus an Alphabet. Uh, but for Same NVIDIA, thing with Meta, right? I mean, Meta Zuckerberg too. announced, I mean, how much, how many billions of dollars did they they buy up in chips and, and those chips right. are still being waited, waiting to be used. And it seems like all my uh, my WhatsApp, my Facebook runs pretty much the same. I mean, I'm sure they're going to come up with something, but there's a lot of pressure on now to deliver. A question from a trading standpoint, though, Gareth, is that if the rubber meets the road for margins on NVIDIA and things cool off, how do you even figure out what might be a repricing potential? I mean, when you 5x basically in a year, where do we even begin to analyze that type of chart if it does peak out at some point. Yeah, and what you have to do in these situations is go step by step. So what we know is that just recently, the previous high before this breakout was around that 970 level. So the first leg down takes us back to the previous high pivot. That is now support. It was resistance. It now becomes support. And then if we break through that, you look at the next pivot on the way down. But really, again, on a technical basis, you should expect bounces along the way at all of these previous major highs uh, until you get down to a point where valuation makes a lot of sense but but again it would not shock me within two years i mean if we look at 2021 and where tesla was at 400 and change dollars a share and it's gotten it got down to a hundred dollars it was a 75 percent drop mm -hmm. in about two to three years on tesla it would not shock me and i know this may be shocking to a lot of people but it would not shock me to see nvidia back to 500 to 250 dollars a share within two to three years Okay, uh, and to the point, I think that the comparison there is about as good as we can get NVIDIA versus Tesla. To your point on the way Tesla came down, a few of those kind of fulcrums, those pivot points, those volume profiles, the big nodes on the way up kind of serve as your gauge for the way down. If NVIDIA does do a, a reversal, if it does come off, doesn't mean that it's coming all the way back down, right? Like Tesla, too, had some big rallies along the way. So I imagine this will stay a highly tradable stock around those technical points for a while. Does that extend to the chip maker space as a whole, Garrett, or should we really be putting NVIDIA in a world of its own? Well, right now, it almost does seem like NVIDIA is in a world of its own. SMCI was one of the hottest chip plays, and now that's kind of stalled out. I think today it's down 30 or $40, while NVIDIA is around flat to positive on the day. So it does seem like even AMD is much further lagging on NVIDIA. But I will say this, like you said, trading and investing, there is, there's always opportunity. So as stocks go up, there's opportunities. As stocks come down, there will be bounces. It's very rare something goes straight down. Uh, more likely, it kind of takes the stairs down 
down. So it goes down sharply, then has a big bounce, then goes down again, has a big bounce. And so for me as a swing trader, there'll be so many opportunities on the way down, just like on the way up to trade. What about the stock split? What view do you have on that? Does that matter? I saw a pretty interesting take someone sent me that uh, AMD will be the one that gets hit when Nvidia splits because now there's no need to trade AMD as the cheap alternative. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's one way of taking it. But but for me, this, the stock split, as, as many of us know, there's no difference in the fundamentals of the company. It's just basically you're going to get nine shares for the one that you're currently holding. So you'll have 10 total shares. Um, and then in reality, I think it's more of a hype job. We've seen, when we, by the way, if you go back to Tesla, Tesla also did this same split. And that kind of almost marked the top. So I'll, next week, I believe that mm. stock split takes place. And I'm in the camp that this is actually a topping signal because NVIDIA is running up on this news going back to their earnings you know we were expecting 24 billion in revenue they came in at around 26 but the street was actually looking for 26 so the numbers kind of came in line with the whisper numbers and so i do look at a lot of the momentum to the upside as people chasing the trade and the stock split kind of excitement and i do think that once we get it it's much like like when the bitcoin etf got approved we saw bitcoin come down 20 percent off of those highs very very quickly mm. hey garrett the last one for you if uh, NVIDIA does kind of have this reset, I would imagine that the rest of the market's probably under some pressure too. If you had to guess a year from now, Apple versus NVIDIA, how close are those market caps and do you think NVIDIA could retake? Put you on the spot. Yeah, so so number one, if NVIDIA comes down, yes. I mean, at, a, at an almost $3 trillion valuation, um, you know, it literally can power the market up or down. So if NVIDIA does pull back 20%, it'd be hard to imagine that the markets would not be down decently on that same move. Um, in terms of market cap, who is the leader? I'm going to go with Apple still, um, yeah. and I say that mainly because I think Apple is more reasonably priced with better longevity over the past 10 years versus at this point, yes, NVIDIA is the hot name, but again, if those margins come down, that's a problem versus Apple kind of has its established low margins and is still trading where it currently is. So I would say Apple still has the lead on market cap. All right, there we go. Uh, Gareth, fun conversation and a, a good deep dive there in NVIDIA. Helpful stuff to try and figure out what to watch uh, for traders going forward. Appreciate your time. Thank you so much. All right, good stuff. Gareth Soloway with an extensive analysis there of NVIDIA and some strategy and trading. Good stuff and a nice uh, platform for us to think about Tesla versus NVIDIA. I like that uh, comparison. Gareth Soloway, Chief Investment Strategist at VerifiedInvesting.com. Thanks for tuning in to Market Overtime. I'm Oliver Rennick. Tune into the Schwab Network every day, 24-7 at schwabnetwork.com.